uh, Lord, as it is to me to take us back to the heady days of the coalition, <coughs> you could probably summarise uh, my talk in saying that uh, I agree with everything that Jonathan said, I think, in, the, uh, in, in his talk, but we'll see about that. So I think... Uh, oh, I should probably put it on the slide, show. So I think as, uh, as everybody in this session is made clear, the uh, ethno-nationalist racists are interested in connecting themselves with ancient people. Sometimes we totally take it out of context in very silly ways, um, like at a, a, a Charlottesville. Um, and these people consider ancient DNA ancestry to be of tantamount importance because they see it as a way of direct, uh, directly connecting themselves uh, with the past. And there's no doubt that particular result because of this results from ancient DNA are being uh, appropriated by ethno-nationalist groups and then by extension archaeological information as well. And it's important to say that there are whole communities of people online who, because of their obsession with genetics and obsession with, with um, linking themselves with ancient peoples and, and uh, sort of grounding their mythologies in the, uh, biologically determinist perspectives have actually developed a competence, a relative level of competency in genetics. And I would say <coughs> something to think about, sort of a competency in genetics that is beyond what most archaeologists have, I, I would say. So um, that's worth bearing in mind. That doesn't mean their, their ideas are any more correct, but it gives them a sense of plausibility, uh, which inspires other people and makes it more e easier for those people to dismiss um, experts. Um, so I think uh, this has come to particularly the appropriation of ancient DNA has come to the fore because of some of the uh, the way that um, certain narratives of of the past that have been have emerged out of ancient DNA research have I would argue superficially resemble ones that were uh, uh, once associated with uh, racist uh, ideologies. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's potentially a mistake to suggest that um, the narratives that are coming out of ancient DNA at the moment are particularly susceptible to uh, nationalist appropriation. Uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, what the ancient DNA says, they, they have to contort it. This stuff is too important to nationalists uh, and ethno-nationalists particularly for them to lay, say something contrary to what they want it to. So they will distort it, manipulate it, discredit people, discredit parts of papers uh, in order to make it fit. So particularly if you go back uh, 15 years or so, um, you had these very early ancient DNA studies that, that were suggesting there was sort of 12,000 years of uh, continuity in Britain. And this stuff was used by ethno-nationalists then. And, and, and you know, th this was used by archaeologists who had uh, 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 an ideological idea of um, how... Of, uh, sort of uh, population continuity uh, in Britain. This was used, these answers were used by them to sort of say that they supported them, but it was, they were also used by nationalists, particularly BNP, who had this, these particular studies on their website um, to suggest that the, the British population has been the same for the last 12,000 years. So I, I don't think necessarily it's about that particular narratives of migration are particularly susceptible to uh, appropriation. Um, narratives of continuity are too. And in fact, any narrative that can emerge out of ancient DNA will be manipulated because it's too, because it was too important. Um, and I, th I think there are strategies to, to, I think ancient DNA and archaeologists working on ancient DNA papers can try and do more to take responsibility for uh, the way that their stuff is received, but that there will always be a hardcore of alt-right figures that even if you add a statement to a paper of, of, of far-right figures, even if you add a statement to the figure, uh, even if you, you try and control a press release, they will discount it and reinterpret it in whatever way uh, they like. And it, so it becomes then about trying to limit or uh, challenge or inoculate the public against that kind, those kind of uh, fringe ideas. Um, and going back to sort of, this is sort of a little check man as well, Perry was saying, um, uh, and, and it's came out of the diversity in Roman Britain um, thing, is that sort of sometimes people are guilty of doing it the other way. So I think that there was a whole lot of debate over whether Roman Britain was diverse. And this was kind of um, 
engaging with, to some extent, engaging with the arguments that uh, right-wing ethno-nationalists make about <coughs> uh, diversity in the past, almost accepts the premise that the ancestry of people in the past dictates what the ancestry of people should be uh, in the present in Britain. That, divert, that, that basically the diversity that we see in the past is contingent on the diversity uh, uh, in the, sorry, the diversity we see in the present is contingent on the diversity we see in the past. That um, uh, Roman Britain was diverse, that justifies modern Britain being diverse. But, you know, it's good to show that even by their own twisted logic, white nationalists are wrong about uh, their ideas. But in the first instance, I think we always have to um, challenge this idea that ancestry defines nationhood and heritage, particularly deep ancestry. Um, uh, and that this has no bearing, real or little bearing, on, on, on nationhood or uh, heritage. And it's about understanding our recent history, our recent collective uh, history, particularly in this country, in respect to uh, empire. And the, the, I, I find that the problem with this is, the problem is that, is that uh, as, as Jonathan was saying, slightly more benignly, these, these ideas, unfortunately, embedded within the public and sometimes embedded in the way that we communicate heritage and, and archaeology to people, that um, it's all about our ancestors, <coughs> meet your ancestors. When I talk to, talk to people about genetics, they often ask me, when did we become us? And these kind of things. I mean, not only is this a rare, quite a narcissistic view of heritage and archaeology and that it's viewed as being everything leading to us, um, it's, it's something that we need to uh, need to undermine. It's very e e exclusionary because if you, people don't feel like they have a deep ancestry in a particular place, they feel like that they don't have a stake in their ancestry. But I mean, I, I'm sort of picking on this example just because it doesn't matter. Find people still using, sort of, uh, imp implicating our ancestors to talk about heritage sites, uh, archaeological um, sites. Uh, and so, so I think that Jonathan last posts in response to uh, the Wayne Smithy stuff uh, did sort of chat with my views on this, that particularly the country narratives that imply people need to have ancestral roots in place, truly belong not there, emphasising these ideas of ceaseless change, and also emphasising radical history over defining these cosy, uh, uh, romantic uh, narratives. Uh, I think that, thinking about it, what this often does is that, you know, we're, we're looking for ways in which to engage people by finding things that speak to universal human experience, that, um, uh, you know, mourn it, um, that people mourn, that uh, uh, people eat, people sleep, all, all the universal things, and to sort of connect people with the past. But at the same time, I think with so much emphasis on people's ancestry, this somehow gives the impression that we have more in common with people in the past who occupied the same space than we do with people who are occupying the same space today that are, are perhaps uh, have, have uh, a different culture, you know, those things about mourning and think, mourning and, uh, uh, and dealing with sickness and whatever, they're all sort of truisms, but, but broadly speaking, I think that uh, we probably, we have more in common with the people that we uh, dwell with today than we do with people who dwell in the same place in the past. And they think that relying on these um, sort of ideas about um, uh, familiarity in the past sometimes uh, makes people feel like they have more in common with people in the past than in the, in the present. Um, so in terms of that, I think that it is important to emphasise radical, um, more radical aspects, and this isn't just an engineer, but our goal is a whole that shows against it the, the inherent weirdness of the past and sort of subvert people's expectation of how things should work, again showing that, um, you know, while the past is interesting, broadly speaking, we have more in common with people who are in the, in the present, and that's where uh, developing meaningful ideas about um, um, community, uh, heritage, and nationhood should come from. Um, and I think that, you know, I mean, the Cheddar particularly is one of these ones that things that is... Uh, Inherently quite radical, I think, um, and similarly with the reconstruction of White Hawk one. But there's lots of things you could take from ancient DNA and foregrounds that would be classed as quite radical. Oh, I think that's good. Uh, ideas. 
the fact that uh, these populations, that up in the, these ancestors that come together in um, Europe and Britain specifically, are as divergent from one, relatively divergent from one another as different ancestors from different continents today. So if you had people who were living in Britain during the Neolithic who were mixing with these uh, people who had been there from the Mesolithic, you know, if people with those, those kind, of, kind of divergent ancestors we see today, we would describe as being mixed race. You know, we'd never call them mixed race in the past because it's totally anachronistic and, and understandable. That's what we're causing with that. So that kind of thing, uh, uh, the idea that the population of Chetamon came from essentially doesn't exist anymore in, uh, in unmixed form. Um, so, and emphasizing those aspects, I think, is a way of trying to uh, unhinge this idea amongst the public that your heritage and your nationhood is about your, your, your deep ancestry. Also, it's worth saying that this just doesn't work. Obviously, on an ideological moral level, it doesn't work. On an intellectual level, it also doesn't work. So this is a plot of um, someone's genealogical ancestors, 17 generations back, and their distribution geographically, uh, and their number. And the red, in terms of, is the number of ancestors there. They, they have and spread through space. So geographically incredibly diverse. This is sort of 17 generations back, so around 500 years. The blue is what proportion of those ancestors that inherited their DNA, any, any DNA from. So, when you get back into just 500 years, the proportion of ancestors that you've inherited DNA from is infinitely small. So your, your genetic ancestry only really tells you about your recent ancestry, it doesn't tell you about, you know, can't tell you, your deep ancestry is, is legion. Uh, basically, if you, uh, everyone that was alive thousand years ago in Europe is the ancestor of anybody, everybody with any recent European ancestry alive today. Um, <coughs> similarly, everybody that was alive 6,000 years ago is the ancestor of more or less everybody who's alive in the world uh, uh, today. So, even on a technical basis, talking about our ancestors and specifying it doesn't make it, it in being more specific, doesn't make any sense. But I think before we get to these arguments, we shouldn't accept the premise and say that it's not about ancestry uh, in the first place. I think also Jonathan's right to emphasize uh, the idea of mutability and that when people talk about where, where, when we became us and that we, we were not, there was never a point when we became us, we're constantly changing. Uh, our genetics are changing by migration, by drift, by selection. We're not the same genetically as we were even, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and the rate of this change varies depending on this process, but it is ceaseless. Uh, and ancient populations were not becoming us. Uh, populations were not the same as us in the past and won't be the same as us in the future as well. Uh, and that's... So I think if it was about recommendations, it's about taking ancestors, trying to make a conscious effort to take ancestry out of the equation when you talk about um, archaeology and, um, and nationhood. Uh, even when it's become so prominent because of some of these ancient DNA studies. Thanks.